I wrote a note to all of you this week that went out on what's it called, Lorna, constant comment? Okay. I didn't, I didn't do any of the mechanics of that, all right? That is not my spiritual gift. But I did write the note, and in that note, I included some comments from two guys that I went to seminary with um, just a few years ago, 45 years ago. We keep track of each other once a month in a very open, frank, the current word, transparent conversation, and we're nothing is off limits and we help each other support each other encourage each other hold each other accountable and they have been most curious why at one point I retired from the church at a at a nice nice place and then they questioned my sanity about why I got into county politics in Houston <laughs> and then they questioned my uh, good sense that I have returned to this kind of work like have you lost your mind and I said I've got I've got something more to give so they always say like what are you preaching on and then they get to make fun of it so I said I'm in a stewardship unit you're doing a unit I'm doing a unit why don't you just give it away because it's my job like it was supposed to have been your job and they say you can't do that they're never going to come back after you said that you've done one week. They're not going to come back. And furthermore, you like being liked. And if you talk about those issues, they're not going to like you. It reminded me of conversations I used to have with my mother, the English professor once upon a time. She called me on Thursday afternoons as I'd be driving home. And she'd say, Jamie, you got your sermon? I said, yeah, I Jesus gave me a sermon. All right, what's your first line? I give her the first line. What's the theme? And I'd give her the theme, and she said, you can't preach that. <laughs> I was like, well, why not? Those rich people in Houston are going to run your sorry <laughs> behind, out of town, on your cassock. And I said, well, hopefully some other town will pick me up. And he says, you're there to be nice. And I'd say, I mean, we had this a hundred times. And I'd say, no, I'm not. I'm there to be faithful. Huh? Well, send me your new address. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I like being liked? Well, yes. Do you like being liked? If you don't like being liked, come see me. We have another class for you. <laughs> but I know that I'm not here to be liked. I'm glad you, some of you do some of the time. But I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to be faithful. I'm here to love you, and I do, and to love Jesus, and to love Jesus in a way that you know I love Jesus and love you, and I'm here to lead. I'm here to lead as I am being led, and I need to be clear about that. That it's not about me and my leadership, but it's about, hopefully, prayerfully, a leadership that comes through me. What helps me to be really clear about all this is the first reading. You might want to look at your insert. And I, we're not going to look at these lessons exhaustively, but this one's really important. Paul says, think of us in this way as servants of Christ. So we're servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. So what are the mysteries? Life itself is a mystery. 
we can't explain why we're here totally. Jesus coming to us is a mystery. God even loving us is a mystery. <laughs> the cross is a mystery in terms of the forgiveness that's shed abroad. The, the, the resurrection's a mystery. The church is a mystery. St. John's is a mystery. <laughs> the fact that this church is still here, that's a mystery. And moreover, it's required of stewards that they should be found trustworthy. I think about everything that I do as being a steward of the time I'm given, of the abilities, some abilities somewhere that I've been given, the mentors and coaching I've been given, and I'm a steward of my time here. I'm a steward of 40 plus years of having the privilege of being a priest What we need to understand about stewards is that stewards are accountable to the owner. And I believe that someday I will need to give an account of my time, my time, and my time here. And that Jesus will ask me, is there one person who believes in me because of what I have given you to say, is there one? Is there one person who's been given hope or courage or healing? Is there one? And I believe that I will need to give a, a report, and I bring that awareness to you every Sunday. And I feel that as is I'm kind of catching my breath after the gospel and looking up there and thinking, I'm going to have to turn around here and preach. And I'm going to be looking at a sea of need. God's children, yes. The beloved of God, yes. And a sea of need. And I know that's true. If that might not be true for you this Sunday, be really grateful because it will be by next Sunday. <laughs> And that I better do something more than just talk about church. I better, I better give you a lifeline. Because we all take our trowns drowning. Now it says about stewards that they need to be trustworthy. What I'm saying about myself, I want you to hear for yourself. Because we're all stewards together. And I want you to know that someday, as a steward, you will need to give a report to the owner of your life. If you say you believe in Jesus, you're giving away ownership of your life. And that you will need to someday give an account. And I don't want you to put it off until you're on your deathbed to be, before beginning to think about it. This is the day to be thinking about that and, and looking at how do I want to live and then how do I want to die? How do I want to let go of this life? And I've had the great privilege of being with many dozens, hundreds of people right at the edge. And what I can tell you is that a lot of the things that we think matter do not. And a lot of the things we take for granted are the things that will rise to the greatest importance. Are you being trustworthy with your life? Are you being trustworthy in your stewardship? And stewardship is, is not simply money, it includes that, but it's time. Are you being a good steward of your abilities? You're not just here. We're not just here to please ourselves and to lose half of our life on some device. Somebody came to me recently. I don't have time to pray. Oh, really? Talk to me about that. What do you do with your day? And then I said, I said, meddlesome me. I said, I'm not nice. I, I said, how, what's your average amount of time per day on a device? Seven hours. Seven hours. 
Did, need I say more? No. But with me, it is no small thing that I should be judged by you or any human account. And what Paul is describing there is he's standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't say that to scare anybody or to sound ominous. I say it, though, to wake us up. Now, the one we're going to face, the one who is the owner, has more love than I can describe and more grace than I can describe. And yes, we're all covered up. We are. And let's not just take that for granted. The best way to say thank you to Jesus for his life is to live a thankful and grace-filled life. Every day in seminary, we sang Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for, to God for the joy of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout and with psalms. And if you say that every day for year after week after week, month after month, year after year, you've stopped here. Well, I stopped sort of like it just, you just. But one morning I got it. I mean, like three years into saying it. Come, let us sing. And all of a sudden, it felt like the, the air began to vibrate. And I thought, this is a charismatic experience, and I'm Anglo-Catholic. I don't believe in these things. <laughs> in all this talk about stewardship, I want there to be a moment where the air vibrates. I want that for somebody every Sunday where all of a sudden it's not just we're going through the motions and saying the prayers. Some of you have said for, like, where's George? George, George has probably been saying, George, you back there still? You wake, George, George. George has probably been saying it for 80 years, George. 70, 60, George? That's in love. <laughs> but at some point, May the air vibrate and may you know that you're not alone right now in your life. You're not alone in these pews. That there's a presence here with you. And so I pray in the midst of this difficult subject for, for all of us is that you feel like, oh, there's something really going on here. Now the next lesson, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, you all with me? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? In other words, your body doesn't belong to you. It just doesn't. What you have from God is a gift from God, and you're not your own. You're not your own. And that is the fundamental stewardship struggle that all of us have. If we think we're the owners, we're going to resent this. We're going to resent anybody talking to us about our stuff because it belongs to us. But if we understand that it's all about stewardship and it's all his already and we give a portion back and the giving of the portion back is a privilege, it changes everything. For you were bought with a price. In other words, at Han you know how at Hannaford's when, it, when you get cider or milk or something and they put a little sti orange sticker on it. What does that orange sticker say? Paid. I'm going to order orange stickers for everybody. <laughs> Where's the altar guild? They're getting really anxious. <laughs> but that is what's on our foreheads. When we call Jesus our Redeemer, we are saying that he redeemed us out of slavery to sin and death and evil. And where did he pay the price? On the cross. We are kidnapped without him. We're paid. The gospel lesson is, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume. I can remember being at that fancy church in Houston and somebody just got a, a, a new car. And uh, 
wanted to come by and take me for a ride, and this was a lot of car. This was more car than people spend on houses. And I mean, it, and, and I, I went for a ride, and it was pretty thrilling, and I was really glad it was not my car, because you you know, when you get a new car and you park at the grocery store with a new car, you park about a mile away, right? <laughs> and he did, and it still got dented. Oh. I thought he was going to die. <laughs> we had a little stewardship conversation. <laughs> but very often that's where we do store up our, our treasures and, and stuff, and it all does get dented. And remember, we're all dented people. It all does rust. So where's our treasure? Where are we making the deposits? As I just talked about being at the people right at the edge from this life in the next life, I'll tell you the treasure that mattered was the love people shared and the love they received. They didn't talk about their car. They didn't talk about their camp. They didn't talk about how much they ever made. They didn't even talk about that their names are on certain buildings. But they talked about love. The love they gave, the love they received. And what will most matter to you is not what you have, but what you have given away. Because love is the only thing that goes from this world to the next. In Acts, all who believed were together and had all things in, in common. They distributed the proceeds to all. What I want you to hear in that is that our giving of our time and our talent and our treasure is not simply for us, and it is a sole issue for us, but it's also a sole issue for the whole community. There are some of you who have been blessed with more means than others, and that mean, means there's, there's a certain responsibility and accountability to give as, as we carry this thing forward. Otherwise, this place does not exist. And all the hope that's here does not exist. And all the grace that's here does not exist because our stewardship is the fuel that drives ministry and mission. So if we don't do it, we hurt ourselves. And if we don't do it and don't contribute, everybody else is as well. Now, I love this next lesson from 2 Corinthians for as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry. Just imagine that. That's going to be the motto for stewardship next year. We're going to, we, we are all here begging to give. I've, you know, most often is we beg you not to talk about it. We will beg together to give when we know that we're children of God. And when we know that we're, we're forgiven, when we know that we have a mission and purpose in this life, when we know that we have God-given talents and abilities, and then that, that earnest asking that we contribute begins to happen. And it's not about me arm twisting and it's not even about Don getting up and talking about, you know, about heat and light. Not that he would ever do that anymore. Maybe once upon a time a decade ago. But he's over it. He's repented. <laughs> and that's not a way to do this. That's, that's, a, that's a business model. But we're not a business. We're the edge of the kingdom of God. Each of you, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, must give as you made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. I was so happy last year when we had Covenant Sunday, and that will be next Sunday when I invite everybody to come forward and lay your, your stewardship card on the altar. I did not see one glum face. I was watching very carefully. <laughs> And I've seen that plenty. How little can I get away with? I didn't see one. And I know I'm not going to see one this year. And I still want you all to come forward. Yeah, all right. 
So what do we end with? But speaking the truth in love and grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body is joined and knit together in every ligament, building up the body's growth in love. So I imagine you all know by now that we've been in a building up process. And I'm not talking about bricks and mortar. I think some of you might have felt like it was um, the community was tending towards the rubble. So what we're about is a mighty work for God. And, and why is it important? So I'm driving up this past Wednesday, and I'm not in a very good frame of mind. I'm thinking, you know, I'm listening to my friends. What am I doing? Nutter, what are you doing? It's time to retire one more time. It's just like enough already. And I was dwelling on the same old arguments, the same old wrangling, the same old issues, the same old worries, the same old anxieties, and I'm thinking, you've not made one darn bit of difference. Throw it in! Like, no, no, no. It's a little extreme. 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 Okay. Thank you. you got, we're good? Yeah. I was being extreme, Ralph. Yeah. But as soon as I got here and I began to see people, I'm like, all right, all right, get over yourself. <laughs> Did any one of you ever get into a little swivet like that? Yeah, just, just me. All right, okay. And then we had the service, and I love seeing people around the altar. And then we had, we had a, a Bible study, which is different than Bible studies generally. If you hear Bible study and hear boring, you're missing it. We had that. I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm getting filled back up. And then... There's a child of God at my door, about 8, 8.05. And by 8.05, after all that, I'm, I'm cooked. I'm... But she's standing at the door. Don't ask me who it is. And she says, can I come in? I'm like, yeah. And I've been worried from her from the first moment I saw her here about four or five months ago. And she said, I have a letter for you. I said, okay. I didn't want to send you an email. I wanted to give you a letter. I said, okay. So I, I take it and I begin, you're not going to read it now. I said, well, thought I might. No. I said, okay. And then she started to walk and she said, okay, read it. About a page and a half. And everything that I hope and pray for was in that letter. That we're here to change and transform and save lives. And there it was. And what it told me was that without this place, this person's ability to write letters may have been over. And she talked about you all and how she's been loved and cared for. And, and then she ended with, I think I'm finally going to believe these words. I believe I am a child of God. And I believe that grace covers all, even for me. So all of this is about the life-saving business, including our own.